Okay, Yorick, the battery boom is well underway in Australia, thanks to the federal government battery rebate that's just rolled out. It sure is, Mark. Now, one good reason that you would get a battery is for backup protection, right? I agree. It's one of the few things that is not thoroughly thought about by customers, and we're going to take you through the essentials to do battery backup right. Okay, let's go. All right, let's get into it. Okay, Yorick, I think there is a lot of confusion in the industry or with customers about the term backup. So a lot of customers, I think, think that when they talk about backup, they go, oh, can you make sure you back up my pool? And can you make sure you back up my air conditioner? And which appliances are you going to back up at night time? That's exactly right, Mark. So there is a difference between a nighttime power supply from the battery and backup in a blackout or, or grid outage. And we call this EPS backup, so an emergency power supply. So the primary focus of the battery is to charge and discharge to keep what's going to and from the grid zero as best as it possibly can. So by default, it's going to try and run your, all your appliances at night, uh, regardless of what's going, until the battery is either flat or until you're pulling more power than what the battery in the inverter can supply. Okay, there is an asterisk around that. So normally it's going to try to supply everything, but right. there is a difference with something like EV chargers. So yep. you might decide to set your EV charger up. Let's say you're on a power plan, say uh, an EV specific power plan where you get really cheap power from midnight to say six in the morning. Well, we can actually program your inverter not to discharge during those times so that you're not putting extra wear and tear on your battery for a very marginal gain in cost. Okay. So by default, your battery is going to supply every appliance in your house uh, at night time. Yep. When the grid is turned on? When the grid is on. Yep. But in a blackout, yeah, we're talking a different story. It is. So when we're in a blackout, now we're choosing, well, what are your most essential circuits? We're not doing off-grid systems here. These are specifically grid-connected hybrid inverters, and the backup or you know battery EPS connection is there as a backup circuit, as an emergency. You know, How often do we have blackouts in southeast Queensland? It's pretty rare, but when they do, they can be quite some time. Yeah, yeah. And because we aren't building in all the redundancies that you would have if you were completely running off-grid, there's some things to consider, and there's sort of three reasons about why you would choose to do partial backup in a blackout yep. compared to backing up your whole house, right? Yep. Now, can you give me the first reason that we would choose not to back up every single so house point in the house? The first reason I would not do full house backup, and I'll just talk a little bit from my own experience. I've got everything except for my EV charger on my backup circuit. So if I have a blackout, everything works except for my car, and so, or my car won't charge, and that's because I don't want to drain my battery overnight. Let's say I have a midnight blackout, and I'm fast asleep, and I, I can't get up to turn it off. I don't want to wake up and find that I've got no battery uh, capacity left. That is one of the main reasons that you might want to be a bit more selective. So, so you want, don't want to drain the battery. And okay, so you're talking about maybe also having larger loads. Yeah, so like things like pools, um, hot water systems, a large air conditioning unit, um, you know, things that you may not be essential if you had a short blackout. They could very quickly completely eat up all that stored energy. So there is a reason just to separate it out. But what's, let's say I've got a big 50 kilowatt hour battery. Yeah. Actually, first, before we go there, isn't the solar going to keep on charging the battery anyway during the day? Well, it is. So look, I mean, firstly, how often do we have blackouts that last multiple days? Mm. Okay. But look, let's say we have another cyclone, which we had recently in, in Brisbane, and you lost power for three days a week, maybe even multiple weeks. I, I have some friends who lost power for quite some time. Yes, if you completely drain the battery and there's enough sunlight, it'll start to recharge the battery and is able to do black start. And this is for both the Fronius with their batteries, as well as the Tesla. Wrong answer, Yorick. Okay. What I was going for is that, let's say you had a power wall too, and this is something that we learned about that cyclone in Brisbane, you know, yeah. Southeast Queensland recently. Um, I had, had a, not one of our customers called up with a power wall too, and they had a three-phase inverter. And the Powerwall 2 couldn't keep the three-phase inverter online in a blackout. So okay. I think that's something that people... That's a <laughs> trick question, Mark. That's, that's, where, that's where I was angling, is that not every system, every system that we do, every go to keep on running, the battery will charge from the solar pan panels in a blackout. Don't assume that's true, because often people, don't, installers don't know what they're doing. Th that is true. Look, look, for our customers, it's all about making sure it's designed correctly. If you have a DC coupled battery or a, and a inverter that's capable of charging the battery in a blackout, most modern systems will, by default, charge the battery during a, a a blackout. Okay, so let's assume that the system was installed properly, that it, it will charge off solar. And let's yeah. assume that you've also got a 50 kilowatt hour battery or something. You just went overkill, which people are doing now because of the rebate. Yeah. 
There's another reason, a second reason that you wouldn't want to do whole of house backup. Yeah, that's right, Mark. Let's talk about single phase inverters first. Okay. So for single phase inverters, look, you can have a 10 kilowatt single phase inverter and you might be able to get eight to 10 kilowatts out of that inverter. It takes quite a lot of power to trip, you know, eight to 10 kilowatts. So you'd have to have your hot water running, uh, your aircon on, your oven on, your stove on, maybe a space heater on. It takes a lot to get over that threshold, but you can still trip that inverter. But mm. on three phase, well, now let's say you've got a 10 kilowatt three phase inverter. In a blackout, it's basically three small single phase inverters, and it can only output maybe three and a half kilowatts per phase or four kilowatts per phase. This small hot water system um, has a fairly big element. And I think you've got one on the yep. table, Mark. That's a 3.6 kilowatt element. A Fronius Gen 24 10 kilowatt inverter per phase can output 3.68 kilowatts. So that only gives you 80 watts spare on top of just what this hot water system would draw. So it's kind of ironic. It's not tripping your, your inverter in a blackout is not normally a problem for smaller systems where they've got single phase. It's these huge houses that have got three phase. They put a massive solar system in. They might have put a 10 kilowatt inverter on there and they're tripping their system and they're like, how is this possible? Like I, I, I've totally overkilled. Yep. But it's that idea of having three phases and breaking it up, dividing it into three. It's a little bit more. You get 3.68 kilowatts out of each phase that catches the, these little mega mansions. <laughs> yeah. It, look, <laughs> things like lots of little LED light bulbs, they draw very little. But as soon as you start turning on a kettle and a toaster, and look, this alone is about a thousand watts. So you can only run a kettle and a toaster and not much else on that one phase. And uh, yeah, very quickly, you could trip your whole inverter just because you decided to boil a cup of tea and pop on a, some toast. Yeah, yeah. Generally speaking, though, single phase, you're fine. Maybe if you've got a five kilowatt single phase inverter, it's, it will be possible to trip that if you put too much on. Yep. But three phases where you can get a, a catch. Now, there's a third reason though, Yorick. We're talking about three different reasons. The third reason that you might not want to back up your whole house is? So reason number three is the cost. We've got to replace all your essential circuits with class A RCBOs, or they have to be RCBOs already. Yeah, okay. So RCBO, fancy name for a safety switch, right? Yep. You can tell a safety switch in your house, by the way, with this, if it's got a little press button that you can press and it trips it, you should be doing that every six months with your RCBOs. Nobody does. Nobody does. But anyway, so when we are backing up your circuit and we are technically, according to Australian standards, I think we have to then change out all of your safety switches. Make sure you're on a safety switch first, but not only make sure you're on a safety switch, but you're on a type A safety switch. Yeah. Now, the reason for the type A safety switch, this is a new regulation that just came in about two years ago or something like that, that we can only buy type A safety switches rather than type A C safety switches. I'll explain how you tell the difference in a second. But the reason that they've done that is that if there's DC ripple current along the lines rather than AC current, so let's say a fault with a battery? Fault with a battery. Or train line? Train lines, anything. Fault with an EV or something like that. Then these can get blinded and they won't trip. So it's important that when you're, we're upgrading, we have to, especially when we're putting batteries on and EV chargers and, you know, everything is changing in your house, that, well, it's we have to by legislation. And it's also a smart idea. It's a smart idea to upgrade these every now and then. Anyway, kind of like a smoke alarm. You wouldn't leave a 20-year-old smoke alarm in your house or it's yeah. not a good idea. Well, Martha, so how do I know if mine are type AC or type A? Yeah, okay. We'll bring up a little image. But basically, there's this, I can't even see it, you know, so you have to have good glasses. But there's this little tiny sine wave and flat wave. So that sine wave, that curvy wave is saying type AC. And the straight two lines is type DC. If there's an AC fault or a DC fault as well. So pretty important. Now the problem with that is, okay, whatever, these these cost 50 bucks or something like that. And let's say we you've got 10 circuits or 20 circuits in your house, that might be 500 bucks or a thousand bucks in parts alone. How long is it going to take us to change these out? Oh, no, not, not long, half an hour to change them all out. Yeah. But it's not the changing it out. Once we change the, these out, we're required to go out and test all of your circuits. So we're going into your bedroom, pulling your bed out, checking the PowerPoint there, going up to your ceiling fans with an earth cable and making sure your ceiling fan is earth. If it's not earth, we have to bring that up to standard. Um, so there's a whole lot more work, which is probably a good idea anyway. But reality is, it is just creating a lot more work and a lot more expense. Where if you go, my board's modern enough, it might have the old breakers in it. But just when we're in the off-grid mode, we're going to make sure the three or four circuits that we're backing up 
will switch out. It won't cost us anywhere near as much to switch for. Yeah. Like out. So if you yeah. don't need your whole house backed up and you know what is essential, we can then just selectively change out the breakers that you need. And I think that is a great segue onto the next part. How do I choose what are my central circuits and how do I figure out which circuit breakers need to be changed out? What would you do, yours, in, at your place? Well, firstly, I would think have a think about, well, what do I really, really want in a blackout? So I've decided to back up everything except for my charger because I've got a big battery and, and it can discharge really quickly. But if I was on three-phase, I'd probably just choose the kitchen, so things like my fridge and, you know, maybe my kettle. Um, I would choose my lights upstairs and downstairs and, you know, maybe a small little split system if I was worried about a really hot summer night. Yeah. But I'd probably keep it to that. Yeah, and your internet modem. And the internet Cause modem. Because you, you want to be able to see them, your solar monitoring, right? So yeah. that's, that's a little bit of a catch for young players. Can we talk about how you, you, you pick that, how customers practically going to pick that? Because yeah. what I want to try to avoid is us, our sparkies rocking up in the morning, you're ducking off to work, and we go, yeah, okay, no worries, we'll back up four circuits, and they end up backing up, and they don't well, do your kitchen, and no, well, they don't do what you want, you know, so yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what I do is I would, say, get a blow dryer or a little plug-in lamp, and I would just go around, and I'd plug it into one of the PowerPoints that I, I want backed up. Maybe I'll get my partner to get on the phone with me, and we'll flick off the circuit breaker, and eventually I'll find out which one of those circuit breakers turns off that PowerPoint that I consider most essential. And then all of the PowerPoints that are connected to that circuit uh, will be on that backup. And then I can go out into my switchboard, put a little bit of tape or maybe mark it with a marker and uh, and I can basically say hey this is the circuit breaker that I want as my backup yeah yeah cool and look here's a funky little way of if you like toys like I do or yeah. tools I mean um, you could go to Bunnings and get something like this for about 20 bucks it's a uh, uh, it's a safety switch tester or a RCD tester so you could plug that into your PowerPoint in your kitchen where you want to make sure you press that button it'll trip the safety switch assuming you've got one in and assuming it's working. So a handy little tool to test anyway, especially if oh, you're... Oh, well, do it every six months, as she said. If you're a chippy or like a home renovation guy, it's, it's a kind of a handy tool anyway. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you can find out a lot quicker that way and, and trip the correct circuits. You also have a pen on the table there. What does that do? Uh, there's a little bolt stick, so you can walk around. Instead of putting your hairdryer in, you just press that and put it near a PowerPoint and it'll light up and make a noise. Um, little bolt stick, it's called. So, yeah, some handy little little gadgets if you're one of those men that like tools and... Yeah, have too many, you know. They're always, always bad to have. Well, anyway, I think that wraps it up for everything you should know before we put in the battery. So the next video, we're going to talk about what you should do once you've got the battery, how to simulate a blackout, and how to find out what the limits are of your battery system. Yep. Okay. All right. It's going on to it. Catch the next one. Catch the next one.